Welcome to Marketing, Media, and Money, your go-to podcast for proven profitable strategies, secrets, and resources from industry experts and global influencers to help you scale your business, shorten your learning curve, and stand out in a crowded, noisy marketplace. Here's your host, award-winning marketing and media strategist and international speaker, Patty Farmer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Marketing, Media, and Money Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here to really talk about a topic that I get asked about a lot, which is sales. So if you struggle with closing the sale, don't worry, you're not alone. Today, we're going to focus on the sales conversation itself, the what to say and when to say it, which are so important, right? Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Nikki Roush is the CEO of Sales Maven, an organization dedicated to authentic selling. Nikki has the unique ability to transform the misunderstood process of selling. With 25 plus years of experience selling to such prestigious organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Newlet Packard, and NASA, Nikki shattered sales records in many industries, including multiple top producer awards along the way. Today, Entrepreneurs and small business owners from a wide range of disciplines hire Nikki to show them how to sell successfully and authentically without being pushy or salesy. So, Nikki, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Patty. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. I am too. Um, I always love when we get to talk about sales. I think it is something people love to talk about, but you're right. They, always get caught up on, well, what should I say and how should I say it? So I think this is really an important conversation. So I have to say that I've heard you say that the sales process is more than just a funnel. It's a staircase. It's a no swings, no slime, no stress, five-step approach to building your business. Now, I have to tell you, what a way to start the show, diving right into that. But let's kind of talk about that. And I know you have a book called That Too, which we will get through. But really, let's kind of talk about that five-step approach. So five steps, could you tell us what each one of the steps are? And then maybe introduce us to the concept of each one. Yeah. So the selling staircase is my signature framework for a sales conversation. Step one is the introduction. And the idea there is to make a powerful first impression and think about how are you coming across? Because people are making judgments about you, whether you hope they are or hope they aren't but they are. So what can you do to set yourself up to make a powerful first impression? That's step one. Step two is create curiosity. This, by the way, is the most missed step in the selling process. Most people, when you talk about sales with them or you're you know, um, getting into what's going on with their business, when they're struggling to have more sales conversations and I ask them, do you know how to create curiosity when you're talking about your product or your service or your business even? They get this look on their face like, what now? What do you like? have? <laughs> Great curiosity. But if you don't create curiosity with people, oftentimes they don't even know how to have a further conversation with you or what's possible for them because they don't know what you know yet. So you've got to pique their curiosity. When you create curiosity, what usually happens is people who are interested parties, prospective clients, will start to give buying signals. Now, buying signals are verbal and nonverbal cues that people give to indicate their interest. Your job is to act on the buying signal. When you get a buying signal after you've created curiosity, you're going to move them to step three, which is the discovery. Now, I call it discovery because I want my clients to be thinking about, is your job to discover what's going on for this person? Do they have a problem? Do they have a need? And do I have a solution that can help them meet that need, solve that problem? You can call it your consultation process. Like, I don't care what you call it, but what I care, what you do here is that you ask really smart questions, questions that uncover for you to identify, am I talking to an ideal client, but also questions that plant seeds in the mind of the person you're having the conversation with to be like, oh, Patty's asking me such smart questions. I need to work with Patty because she knows things I want to know, or she can help me do the things that I'm trying to do. Once you've done a great discovery call with somebody, you now usually have an indication of what is the right next step for them. So then we're going to move them to step four, which is the proposal. This is what I 
where I think the selling actually is happening. This is when you're laying out your offer and you're laying it out based on the information that you gathered in the discovery process. So you should be speaking right to the heart of the matter, right to the heart of what is most important to this person and your offer should align with that. And then step five goes very closely with step four. After you've laid out your offer, you have to issue closed language. So step five is close. Now, this doesn't always mean that you're going to like close the sale, but you're going to attempt to close the sale. So making sure that you get the words out of your mouth. This is the second most missed step in the selling process. Oftentimes, when people feel like people aren't making a decision, I'm, you know, I'm talking to these you know, great prospects, I've got a solution for them. And they seem really interested, but then they go away and they ghost me. Chances are you didn't close on that call. And so you didn't help them make a decision. You didn't make it easy for them to hire you. So those are the five steps. I teach it as a staircase because most people understand that you ascend a staircase one step at a time. The objective is not to meet somebody and immediately close them right? You, you've got to follow the steps. And when you follow the steps, the conversation gets easier. It's easier for the prospect. It's easier for you. You know what step you're on. So you know what to do or say next. So the idea is to make this process seamless, easy, and conversational. When you, we have a framework and you really understand a framework and what each one of those steps is supposed to do, it's a lot easier to do it and be able to do it in a single conversation, right? Because yes. you're not all over the place. And I find that a lot of times because people are afraid of the close, that they'll just do all kinds of other things yes. to, to avoid getting to that. And so what happens is where they had these clear five steps that would have taken them up the staircase to get to the close, sometimes they don't even remember the person on the other side because you now ask them all kinds of other stuff that they didn't have anything. So clarity, of course, is so important. But going back, I wanted you to tell us the step first, but going back to them, we're just going to talk about the, the introduction, which is very, very important, right? You know, but how does it transform the sales process into a series of manageable steps? Because it seems like that's where you're really going to start. Like you said, the second step, curiosity, is the misguided one, the mis Matched one or whichever one you, what did you say? No, Smith. No, no Smith. Smith. Okay. I knew there was, yeah. There, right. But, you know, yeah. really to be able to do the intro right, though, kind of helps you to start that whole series of manageable steps. So, how does it set it up? It's like the setup, right? You know, it just sets everything up right there. Yeah. Well, now creating a, a powerful first impression can happen in a lot of different ways. It could happen because somebody saw something you posted online. It could happen because they heard you on a podcast. Mm -hmm. It could happen because they looked at your website or it could happen because they met you at an event. So when I'm talking about making a first impression, because they say within the first two minutes of meeting you, people have already made over 10 judgments. Actually, they say in the first 10 seconds, they can make up to 10, 10 judgments. So they've, they've decided all these things about you, including, are you trustworthy? Are you credible? And if you're not doing something to set yourself up in those first two minutes to establish your, your credibility, that, that no like and trust factor, I know you talk about this on your podcast, that no like and trust factor, people won't often like even continue the conversation with you. They'll be looking to go like, who else can I talk to or who else can I find online that does this or who others, you know, what other Google search should I be putting in? So what is happening when people first land on your website? What's happening when people see your social media posts? Are they engaging in some way to them? Do, are you planting seeds? Are you, you know, spurring conversation? And when somebody's meeting you for the first time, how are you presenting yourself? Are you coming across friendly and engaging? Are you coming across a little standoffish? Are you being really timid? All of these things they're making judgments about. So once you have awareness about the fact they're making judgments, even though I think now in our current kind of society and day and age, people are like, I'm an advanced human. I don't judge people, which I think, <laughs> congratulations, like you are an advanced human. Everybody else is judging you, just so you know. So let's let's approach it as if people are making judgments. So what can you do to set yourself up? Here's one example. When you're meeting somebody for the first time, one of the missed ways to make a powerful first impression is to introduce yourself actually say your name. Say, 
hi, I'm Nikki. It's nice to meet you. Now, even if you're wearing a name badge or even if, you know, they're like, well, it says right in the corner of my screen what my name is. Now, if you have a really easy name to pronounce or a, a, a really common name like Nikki, like maybe it's not a big deal. But if you have a name that's hard for people to say, they're in their head going like, should I say it out loud? Should I call them by their name? Because what if I say it wrong? Then will I, will they think I'm stupid? Will they be annoyed? Like, they're going to make judgments about me if I say their name wrong. So make it as easy as possible for being to be in conversation with you and introduce yourself. And it shouldn't be awkward. And when you do that, you already spur a conversation because when you introduce yourself, what normally happens, people introduce themselves back to you. Really important too, though, because a lot of times when someone introduces themselves, you've just been waiting for Right. You know, because now you want to have that conversation with them. And you're right. Sometimes when it's about a name, it is really important. Now, obviously, you and I have fairly common names. Right. You know, yeah. But a lot of times I have met somebody and, you know, I can see their name tag has something on it. And, it's like, Ooh. and you're right. We are thinking that, oh, I don't want to say anything because their name is wrong. Right. So I do think that is a really, really good one. But now let's go on to the curiosity. And I really, really like this one. Right. And so what would you say are some of the ways that sales professionals, right, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, how can we effectively keep a prospect's interest during these initial stages? Right. You know, because yeah. this is the one that gets, you know, missed a lot. Like really here, this is where I hope everybody's ready down and now right or down or here. Right. You know, how do we effectively keep their interest? There's really two ways to create curiosity. One way is by the way you respond to somebody's question. The second way is to ask smart questions that lets them go like, oh, let's, let's talk more about that. So let's talk about answering questions because this is actually one of the easiest ways to start a conversation. Now, remember, if you're meeting somebody for the first time. They don't know what you know. They have no idea about your experience or about your business, really, even even if they've been on your website, even if they've attended a training that you've been at. They may or may not really even remember and or they didn't catch that part. So can you pique somebody's curiosity and can you help kind of direct the conversation in a way that helps you identify quickly? Am I talking to a prospective client or am I just talking to somebody that it'll be nice that we spend a few minutes chatting, right? We want to identify quickly if we're talking to a prospective client. So when I say, how do you answer questions? And just to like back this up a little bit, because I, I have to comment on this because it's very kind of the thing that people often helps them remember to create curiosity is I teach creating curiosity as the difference between how you call a dog and how you call a cat. And I know that sounds a little wacky, but stick with me for just a second here. We're, we're so, right in God, our thing. We're curious. Okay, good. Okay, good. So if you think about when you want to get a dog's attention, you change a little bit of your demeanor, your voice, and the way you come across, right? If you want to get a dog's attention, really all you have to do is be like, come here, boy, come here, right? Like excited and upbeat and super like excited. And dogs don't even know what's going to happen. And they're so like, I'm in. I'm so right there with you. Maybe I'm getting a, a treat or maybe we're going for a walk. Who knows? But I'm in. And unfortunately, when people are really excited and they show up in business conversations or they show up to meet somebody for the first time, we have what I call a little bit of dog calling energy because we're like, oh, I know about this person. They'd be an ideal you know, client for me. And I'm so excited to talk about what I do and tell them all the ways that I can help them. But you come off with this dog calling energy and people push away from that. They go, oh, too much, too strong, too fast. So too So. The, yeah, the flip side of this is think about how you call a cat. When you want to call a cat, you definitely can't call it like you call a dog. But you hear people say they're like, here, kitty, kitty, here, kitty, kitty, right? And the thing about cats is sometimes they won't come to that. They'll just give you a look like, what? <laughs> like, I'm not even sure yet if I want to be in this conversation. So when I think about creating curiosity in the way that you answer questions, I, I train my clients to think about, can you create what I call a here kitty kitty response that, that, that lets the other person go, 
oh, what is that? Tell me more about that. Or let's talk about that. Right. So super easy way just to get this started. And I, I'll also say creating curiosity is like building a muscle. It takes practice. You got to work it. Okay. And then as, as you do it more and more, it gets easier and easier to do. But if somebody were to come up to you right now and say, oh, hey, how are you? What's, what's new with you? And if you have a kind of a throwaway line, like, oh, not much. How are you? Or, oh, I'm good. You know, just living the dream. That doesn't actually pique anybody's curiosity. It doesn't open the door for them to talk about something that, again, we're trying to identify, are we talking to a prospective client or not? So if somebody came up to me right now and said, hey, how are you, Nikki? What's new with you? I might say something like, oh, I'm fantastic. I'm, I'm working on re-recording all of my core training content. That's all my answer needs to be. Now I could then say, and how are you? Now they might go, your core training content, what does that mean, Nikki? Like, what, what do you train on? Or what is, like, why are you doing that? Now it like opens the door. They've asked a question. They've shown a little interest. So now I have the ability to give, you know, a short answer to see if that continues to be interesting to them. And I can tell you, because I've been teaching this now for 10 plus years, that when you start to create curiosity, you will have more business conversations with people who you didn't even know yet they could be a prospective client. So when I teach this, I say, come up with your hair kitty kitty response for the week and say it to everybody who asks you a question. How are you? What's new with you? You know, how's your day going? Have a response that that allows the other person to decide whether or not they're interested and they want to further that conversation because you may be talking to a prospective client that you didn't even know about and or you may be talking to somebody who could open a door for you that you could never open on your own when they go, oh, you teach sales? Oh my gosh, my sister-in-law, she just started her company and she needs some help with sales, right? It could be that or it could be like, oh, I didn't know that you did training content, Nikki. I would love to take a course on sales, right? Now I know I'm talking to a prospective client. Now, if I do it, if I give my hair kitty res response and the person goes, Oh, yeah. So um, did you see what the temperature is supposed to be today? And they totally changed the subject. Like, go with them. Stay in the conversation. Don't stop them and be like, hey, I just gave you my hair kitty kitty response. You were supposed to ask me a question. Because the thing about sales and the thing about scripts, right, is that people don't respond like they're supposed to because they don't know about the script. So stay, keep the conversation going. But oftentimes, when you do this, hear kitty kitty response, people go, what's that? Tell me more about that. And tell me more is like so good. One of the things that I didn't even know about that, hey, kitty kitty, <laughs> I didn't even know about the hey, kitty kitty. But I know that for me, whenever people ask me a question, a lot of times, seeming fun how they ask, a lot of things that I like to say is, oh, I'm doing great. I'm happily through my goal of, of booking myself on 25 podcasts, right? You know, or something like that. Right. You know, or that's perfect, you know, or I'll say something like that. And then they'll be like, oh, well, you know, they'll start that. And then it's always really nice because my next response to that when they ask that question is, and you know, the reason why I come to these bits is if I never know anyone, somebody needs to be great for my podcast. So now they know that I'm a giver as well. And I just find that that one really has worked for me really well. It also works when you're having, because I know that oh, we should touch on this. But you know how sometimes people get on coffee calls, right? You know, like you're part of an organization or whatever, and you, you know, get to know you, whatever you want to call them. And you're on them. And then you get to the end, like you just spend like 30 minutes with them. And then you get to the end and they'll say, so Patty, like, you know, how can I serve you? Like, I, I want to, like, what can I do? Or I'll say that to them and they'll be like, oh, I don't know. This, great, this conversation is really great. And they don't have an app. They, like, they don't even know. Like, I'm sitting here telling you that I want to serve you in some way and they won't even yeah. know and i'm always telling people like do you like to be on podcast and really the easiest thing to say is you know oh i'd love introduction to a podcast host right you're not saying can you get me booked on the podcast you're just saying you want an introduction to somebody who has a podcast so i think that people also should be prepared for that question right you know so that's yeah. why i like the podcast one because no matter where i am i can always tweak that that answer in some way, shape, or form, right? You know, so I love that. So let's move on to discovery because I think this one is really good. But what are some, you mentioned this, and I was 
really waiting to get there, <laughs> right? So what would you say? You said that the discovery phrase is crucial for understanding the client's needs, right? So what are some questions or techniques that you recommend for this table? So the first and foremost thing at the start of a consultation call or discovery call is to pre-frame what's going to happen in the call. This sets you up to create safety between you and the prospective client. And I know that might sound a little like, what do you mean safety? Like, why do I need to create safety? You need to create safety because this person who has risked getting on a call with you or having this part of a conversation with you, in order for them to feel at ease and to be really present in the conversation, they need to feel safe. They need to know this isn't like, I'm here to hard sell you. I'm here to like clean out all the things you've done wrong. You know, it's so you've got to state kind of the purpose of the call. The The way that I teach preframe is I'm going to just kind of give you an example off the top of my head. If you and I were to get on a call, I would say, Patty, I'm so excited to chat with you. Thank you so much for taking this time to meet today. We're scheduled to chat for about 30 minutes. Does that still work in your schedule? Like I'm going to check to make sure that you're not under a time constraint. And, and also, I'm setting the stage that we're only talking for a certain amount of time. So this is not a like pick Nikki's brain session, you know, get a free coaching call, right? So I'm going to check about the time, make sure that that works for you. So it gives us some, I would say it's like putting the bumpers up when you're bowling. Like we're just putting some bumpers up, keep, keeping the boundaries. And then I would say, now in order to make this time meaningful and productive for you, is it okay if I start with a couple quick questions? Because this is me asking permission to lead the meeting. If you get on discovery calls and you let your client or prospect lead the meeting, they don't know where they're supposed to go. They don't know what the outcome is supposed to be. So they can derail it unintentionally by doing something like, so I wanted to talk to you about sales, but I wanted to tell you the story about my uncle when I was five. And now you're in story, right? Like time sucks story and you get to the end of the 30 minutes and they are still telling the story. You haven't even gotten a chance to talk about what's going on for them, what prompted them to have this meeting. Like we got to take the lead in the conversation, but you want to do it in a really kind, respectful way, which is why I say ask permission and position it as you asking the questions to make it meaningful and productive for their benefit, not for you. So I don't say, now in order for me to decide whether or not I want to take you on as a client, I need to ask you questions. Because people be like, go kick rocks, lady. Like I could go hire a million sales coaches. Why would I work with you? So it's it's showing respect. So set it up pre-frame. That's the first thing. And then you're going to work into your questions. Now, with questions, you have your standard list of questions. This is one of those places where I say in sales, don't wing it. Don't be like, I'll just what, ask whatever comes to mind. It's like, no, have a set list of questions. You don't have to ask every question that's on your set list. But I always quote the, the Lewis Carroll quote, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. In sales, you need to know where you're going. And those questions should lead people to the path of you moving then to the proposal part of the conversation. So your questions should elicit the information to find out, do they have a problem? Do they have a need? Do I have a solution? And your questions should plant seeds about your expertise, what's possible for them, and create that, like, peak that curiosity, continue to peak that curiosity. So specific questions, here's one that I say most people are afraid to ask, but yet it should not be missed in a sales conversation is, What's your budget or what are you planning to invest or what are you looking to invest when you're thinking about hiring a marketing person or a sales coach or, and people shy away from that question because they were like, well, Nikki, I don't have to ask that question because nobody ever has an answer. It's like, okay, but then I can give you a way to get the answer, but we've got to, we've got to prime it with the question because the one thing you don't want to do is spend a bunch of time especially if you're somebody who has to prepare custom quotes for people, preparing some custom quote for somebody on something, you send it over, you never asked about their budget, you send a quote for 20000 they were thinking they were going to pay 1000 and now we've alienated this client and we have no idea, like it's so hard to earn back any time or effort with them to earn back that business because you lost it because you never asked about the budget in the beginning. So budget is a key question to ask. There's a few others that I recommend, but 
I want to speak to like those questions that plant seeds and create curiosity. And the, the way that I teach this is think of some of those things that make you really unique, either your product or your service or just you, the business, if you're the consultant. What are the things that people are often like, oh my gosh, Patty, you are so good at this. How can you take the this, whatever it is, and put it into a question? So one of mine, we this won't be a surprise, I don't think, to anybody listening. But one of the questions that I ask in a discovery call is, do you know how to create curiosity when you're talking about your product or service? That already plants the seed. Oh, I don't know how to create curiosity. Nikki's asking me this question because she probably can help me with that. No, well, that's really good. And the people are with the kitty and the dummies. <laughs> They're going to be like, no, I absolutely need to know how to do that. We're not absolutely sure, right? In a nice, yeah, who can't relate to Anna kind of a way, right? You know, so I have a good, even though you may not be able to tell the story there, but I love it. So now you're at four, which is really talking about the proposal, right? Like now you're going to do that. Mm-hmm. So what strategies would you suggest that would ensure that it resonates with the client and addresses their specific needs. Now, I know the obvious answer there is because I asked very specific questions, but they're going to tell me those things, right? I know that's probably the obvious question or answer, but what are some strategies? Because I think that, you know, there's strategy and then there's tactics, right? You know, and so sometimes people, yes, you know, got to get the strategy first, then you can get the tactic to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So strategy is you want to speak right to the heart of what they have they have commented on in their questions. So this is it's crucial in a sales conversation to be taking notes, writing down keywords and phrases that they use, not words that you think they should use or, well, what they're talking about means actually this, right? And, and this can be a, a total rapport breaker if you try to change somebody's words because words matter. Words actually paint pictures in the mind of the person who uses that word. And if you choose a different word because that's the industry lingo or that's what you call it, just like how I said earlier, like I teach it as discovery, but I don't care what you call it. If you call it consultation, if you call it a get to know each other call, that's what I'm going to call it when I am laying out my offer to you as to the benefits of this offer and how it's going to serve you. So use their words because it's like the iceberg, right? Like what you see above the water is only like 10, 20% of what's below the water. Those words mean things to people and it paints pictures in their mind. It invokes, you know, memories. It, it invokes that like what I want out of life. So we got to use their keywords when we're delivering back the offer. I believe that you should be asking permission before you launch into your offer So when I've asked the questions, I've got an idea that, you know, yes, this is an ideal client. I don't just start pitching. I ask permission before I pitch. So I would say, you know, based on what you've shared, I already have five ideas of things that we could work on together and the ways to do that. Would you be interested in kind of talking about that now? And then I wait and I get a yes from them because who doesn't want to know what the five ideas are and how does that work, right? Right. So then my five ideas are going to relate back to their keywords and my offer, the way that I'm laying it out, is going to speak right to that. So, you know, you're an ideal client for the VIP program. And in that program, we would be sure to come up with your Here Kitty Kitty responses so that you could test those out. We would make sure that, you know, like whatever their key phrases and words are, I'm going to lay my offer out to that. And then... I'm going to follow right up with the close. So as soon as I lay out the offer, I'm going to make sure I bring in step five. Close has to go right next to, like they're essentially connected. So I lay out the offer and then I say, is that something you'd like to go ahead and get signed up for? Then I zip it and I wait until they respond. Well, it's it's because at this point where you may get whatever objections are holding them back. The deep price could be, yeah, God knows what, right, you know? Although it probably pranks yeah. a lot, yeah, right? But whatever that case may be. But I do agree that, like you said, you've already spoke about budget. That's one of my important questions as well. If you've spoken about that, you already know. So she already been past the price objection because you've already dealt with that earlier, right? When you ask the budget question. But they are common. It is a common hurdle in sales. 
What are some of the effective yeah. responses or techniques you use to overcome these objections? There were people said, I can't afford it. I can't afford it right now. Now is not the time. I actually, one time early on in my business before I was better at closing, we had somebody say to me one time that they needed to pray about it. But I didn't know how to handle that. But I was like, oh, I literally did not know what to say to that. And I was kind of caught off guard. And, um, and I do remember that I asked my mentor at the time and they actually told me that now I don't think I ever could have done this. So it was, it was just not me, but I did kind of laugh at it though. He said, I would have actually just said, okay, why don't we pray? I was like, what? I, you know, I wouldn't have pulled that off for me, but you know, that was like 15 years ago, but really we always do have these common objections. So what are some effective responses or techniques you use to overcome some of those objections and specifically the pricing one? Okay. When you have an objection, the thing that you're going to revert back to is what's known as a, um, my mind just went completely blank. Hold on a second. You're going to do what's called a conditional close. So a conditional close is essentially like, if we could overcome this objection, would you then be interested in moving forward. Now you're going to tweak the language and make it specific. So if somebody said, you know, I'm I'm just not really sure that I can afford this right now, I would say, if I could offer you some ways to make this more affordable, would you then want to move forward and work together? So I got to check if that's the case, because sometimes people will voice an objection, but that's not for their objection. So we got to check to see, is this the real objection? Because if we don't know what the real objection is, we can't overcome it. So we have to check to see, is this a real objection? And then if they say yes, that, you know, yes, yeah, so, you know, I actually do want to work with you, Nikki, but it really is an issue of money. So now I'm going to say, well, you know, if I was able to offer you a payment plan, would that make it more feasible for you? Or if we were to offer you some kind of a prepay thing, or if we were able to start with a lower price offer, like you can have different offers, just give them one and see, right? So for me, it would be, if I was able to offer you a payment plan, would that make it more feasible for you? And if they say yes, then I'm going to talk about the payment plan. But if they say no, Nikki, it doesn't really matter what you charge at this point. I just don't have the budget for it. I just can't swing it. Then in my perspective, they're not an ideal client. They're not ready to move forward. So I would say, is this something you want to stay in touch about? And or please know that when you are welcome or when you are ready, when you do have the finances to do this, it would be my honor to work with you. So know that you're welcome to come back to me. That is beautiful right there. I think that is yeah. so beautiful because I think sometimes people are embarrassed about that. And then you'll hear, I've had clients say this to me, or say, you know what, Patty? I said this to people and then I find out that they go and hire somebody else. Well, I said, well, because they may have been embarrassed and so it's easier for them to go hire somebody else. Yeah. But you need to make it easy for them to come back to you when they are ready. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. So if, if they know that the door is open and that you're not judging and you're not going to be pushy and aggressive about it. Like I, I, one time when I was in the position of, you know, buying something uh, somebody laid it out for me and it, it just wasn't the right fit. They were offended. And they said, and I said, you know, this just doesn't really feel like the right fit for me right now. So I'm going to decline continuing the conversation. And she was like, what? Really? Well, good luck. And wow. Hung up. Now, turns out a couple months later, I actually did need what it was that she was offering. But do you think I went back and gave her my business? Heck no, I didn't. No way would I go back to somebody who treated me like that when at the time it wasn't the right fit. Now, had she been respectful and honored that I was, you know, trying to keep the rapport intact, I was being kind and I was being honest and that wasn't good enough. Like, no, she's never going to get my business. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Really? Yeah. So yeah. I've heard you talk about the concept of anchoring, right? I've heard you talk about so could you pro provide some yes. examples of how you use it when you're presenting those packages to clients? Mm -hmm. So if you're presenting more than one package or more than one option as to ways to hire you, first and foremost, never present more than three. If you present more than three, you'll have a confused client and a confused 
prospect does not buy. So only up to three options. And then what you're going to do is when you lay out the three options, you're going to start with the most expensive option. That's your anchor. You're going to start with the highest price and then you're going to work your way down. And here's anchoring is like setting a price and then working from it. Now you can anchor a low price and that can get you in a big trouble. So you want to actually anchor the higher price and then work your way down because when you do that, a lot of times, so like, actually, let me give you language and then I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing here. So let's say that I say to you, you know, Patty, you'd be an ideal candidate for one of my VIP programs. And let's say you say, oh, I'm interested in that, Nikki. Tell me more. And what's the price for your VIP programs? So I'm going to say the VIP programs range between five and $10,000. Now, at the $10,000 range, you know, or package, here's all the things that you get related back to the things you said you wanted. In the middle tier, you get this, this, and this. And then if you're looking to just like get started, you would get the VIP day and that's the $5,000 offer. Now I'm going to follow up with the close and I'm going to say now based on those three options, Patty, which is the best fit for you right now? Then I'm going to wait and I'm going to let you respond before I talk again. Now what happens when you anchor and you start at the top and you work your way down is that you make it actually easier in the mind of the buyer to pick the option as the best fit for them. And this has to do with kind of human nature. We don't like to give things up that we know we need. Now, flip side of this, we don't like to pay more to get more. So if you start at the bottom and explain your least expensive option and then try to work your way up, you're essentially saying to somebody, you got to pay more to get more. But if you start at the top, you are essentially saying to them, if you're willing to give up all these things, you can pay less. It's a very different mindset for somebody. And it, it actually helps them make a better decision. So I often encourage my clients to come up with an anchor offer. So if if you know that the thing that you most want to sell, let's say it's your top tier, like your you know diamond level VIP, call it whatever you want, then I actually suggest that you come up with an offer that sits above it. That's your anchor, the higher price, the full meal deal. Because a lot of times people will go, well, maybe I don't need the, like, I don't need all the things, but that middle tier is looking pretty dang good because who wants to start with the basic model? I don't want the basic. I'm not basic. I'm going to go with the middle tier. So whatever it is that you want to sell, that should be your middle tier and you should have an anchor that sits above it. And I, I work with my all the time. That's how my anchor first. You know how a lot of times when you're on a website and you're going and looking and you hit the pricing button, right? You see the pricing and you see this like every yeah. day and it'll say, you know, here's this, here's our most popular option, right? You know, and then here's the premium elite or whatever word they want to use. I don't know what this says yeah. about me. I never look at the most popular one because for me, I don't ever want to be the one that everybody else does. It's just not my nature of who I am. So I never like to look at that. And I always feel like, okay, that's the one that really is what they're selling, right? That why it's most popular. Yeah. One less than that, that's true. one that money is really the issue, right? You know, money's the issue. Mm-hmm. And then there are people like me. I think then there are people like me who don't want to be the most popular, who always will want. Like, I don't think nine out of 10 times, I know everybody who's hearing me, like, oh, wow, I want to have a conversation. Right? Nine out of 10 times, literally like 9.7 out of 10 times, I always go with the premium Now, the only time it doesn't, me too. I don't is because there's something in that premium kind of pitch. Like there's something in that premium package that I actually don't want. Like I don't want, and I don't want to pay for something I'm not going to use. Right. You know, so that is also kind yeah. of a thing. And then I will literally, then I always have the conversation. This is what I love about this anchoring because, you know, so let's just say that happened. And I said, well, I really love the premium package. I really love that. There's this one thing in there that really, I'm just never going to do that. It's not something I'm even interested in. But, you know, is there a way that, you know, because if you have those three, that just opens the door to customize it in a way, right? You know, so somebody said, to me, oh, well, if you want that outfit, I don't want this thing. You know, is there something else that is something that you do want? And maybe they might say, oh, I don't know. And so if you really wanted to close on them, I mean, really, I'm going to let you close me right now and say, but wouldn't you just say, well, how about if, you know, you could do this? So I've had people say to me, 
well, Patty, why would we do that? And I just threw an additional, you know, you know, 90 minute call or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? I'll be like, great. Yeah. And then that does it for me because I'm not going to buy something if I know that I'm not going to use it, but I always do want the elite package. So if somebody else switch out one day or something, I, I mean, it's a easy, easy yes for me. And not everybody is me. <laughs> so we're not happening. And yeah. you are doing that and you're doing an offer if there is something in there and people just say well you know what i kind of really do like that one and the price fits and blah 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 but i don't like this one thing like how do you like kind of give us some examples yeah so i'm gonna say this is my all-time favorite quote and i do think as a business owner it's important to run your business this way and this is what i teach around sales it always goes back to my all-time favorite quote Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. The more flexibility that you can show in a sales conversation or in any conversation, the more influence you have. The most flexible person typically has the most influence. So if you want to burn somebody's business and they say to you, I really like this elite package, but I know for certain, like I'm not somebody who takes courses. And I notice you've got these courses in there. And and then if, now, again, depending on your business and if you have the ability to make this decision, which I think you and I do, Patty, in our businesses, right? We're the CEOs of our business. So in this particular case, I might say, well, what would be more valuable for you? And if you, so I'm going to ask the question. I'm not going to make the assumption, right, of what you value. So what would be more valuable for you? Stop, wait, let Patty decide. And if Patty says, I like more one-on-one -on -one time, then I could say, great, I'll actually take out the course and here's what I'll do instead. Now, is that something you'd like to move forward with? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the answer and then I'm gonna follow up the close again. Because if that's all it takes to earn Patty's business, heck yeah, we're gonna sign you up. We're gonna make this work for you. Now there are times where maybe you can't pull something out or that you know the client asks for something that's totally out of whack, right? And they're like, I want private time with you, not this, you know, $10 throwaway thing. And you're like, well, my time is worth more than, you know, a $10 throwaway thing or what, whatever that thing is, right? So it's okay to say to somebody, I totally appreciate what you're saying. and Thank you so much. I'm actually not able to, to change the package. It is what it is. And yet I know that you're still going to get huge value out of the work that we're going to do together. So is this something you'd like to move forward with? I'm still going to try to close, even if the answer is like, I can't change it. Because, you know, depending on like, I work with certain sales reps where they don't have the flexibility of making any changes because they work for somebody else, right? So it's okay to still say like, I appreciate you asking. That isn't something that we can make a change on. Is this something would you ever ask them? them? And would, sometimes it just doesn't make Would you ever ask them sense. something else or no? You would just let them say that one thing? Yeah, yeah, you, you you absolutely could. You could say, is there something else I could do? Or um, is is there a, another way that we could add value to your package, kind of with the package as it is, right? Like check to see, because now here's what I will say. When you're going to do something like that, you, you might actually benefit from giving them what I call a menu. And the reason you give people a menu is because you make it easier for their brain to make a decision. So if you don't want to leave it just open-ended and have them come up with some crazy off the wall, like, well, I want two VIP days and only pay for one, right? Like that's not going to work. So when I would give a menu, I might say, so Patty, is there a way that we could make the VIP day work for you and feel really valuable? For instance, if I was able to, and now I'm going to say A, B, C, or something else. I'm going to give you a couple options. I could give you one or two options and then I could say, or something else. And I say it like it's a question because I'm trying to trigger your brain to say, I want this. Because if I don't know what it is that you really want, it's super hard to earn your business. And you might not even know what it is that you want yet, but our brains are wired to answer questions. And when we make it easy for our brain to answer a question, it will. Like it's like you almost, there's actually a, a term for it where, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there's a term where our brains are so wired to ask questions or answer questions that we actually purposely have to 
avoid answering a question to not want to answer oh, it. Sure. That's, our brains are like Google. If you go to Google, type something in, Google's trying to give you an answer, even if it's wrong. So we got to ask the question to get their brain to give us the answer. And sometimes if you ask too open-ended of a question that's too like general, our brains can't come up with an answer. But if I could say, you know, if I was able to do A or B or something else, now you can go, I don't want A, maybe B would be okay, but what I really want is C. So we've got to give them an I find it's me that sometimes when something isn't working for them and I ask them the question, is there something else that's some value that I could do for you? A lot of times the thing that they say actually costs less than the thing that they didn't want. You know what I mean? It's it's probably something that's so easy to give. Yes, yes, for me, right? You know, and I'm thinking, yeah, all day. Like, I'll do that, right? You know, because sometimes, because we don't know what's valuable to them. So when they say, oh, well, what I find is really valuable is if you gave me that, you know, whatever that case may be, it could be a course or something that literally doesn't take any time of you and you're literally going to give them the link to it and whatever, like, sure, like, no problem, right? So I think that you're right. You have to ask. You don't want them open ended so that they just seek their God knows what, right? So, yes, I love that. So, what are some simple yet effective strategies that will increase the likelihood of selling higher packages? Higher price packages. Yeah. So, the top down selling, the anchoring the, the higher offer and working that down. And then The other way is that you position it, like how you lay it out to somebody is the strategy of how you sell a higher priced offer and actually having a higher priced offer. Because this is the other thing is a lot of times people are like, well, I could build something for you. Well, no, you need to have something built to put in front of somebody. So you actually need the offer. And again, kind of back to the conversation that you and I just been having That if you have it built and they go, well, I like all these things. I just don't like this one thing. You can tweak it. You can adjust it. You can make it work. But if you don't have a higher price offer and you say, well, I could build something for you. Now people are like, "Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe I'll just wait. That's right. That's right. The time, the energy suck, you know, all the effort that you're going to put into something with no idea whether or not. And it should be something that you want to sell. So just coming off, like coming up with it, like in the moment is probably not going to work. So chances are you're going to end that conversation with somebody to try to give yourself time to come up with an offer. You're going to spend time and energy. And then how easy is it going to be to get back onto a call and get their their, um, attention? I find that when you're asking these questions and following the staircase, that you will start to see a pattern. Because yeah. like, I know that for me, that's a little bit easier to do when somebody doesn't want that thing or something that they don't want. Because I see that there's a pattern of things that people do want, right? You know what I mean? I, I realize for me, I find that one of the things that people love when I, they say that they don't want this. And I say, oh, well, what about this? They love that. And for me, that's the same would be for everybody. But for me, one of those things is when I, Either say that I'll give them a strategy session like 45 days later as a check-in. They love that. Or one of the things I tell them is I'll give them three 15-minute like um, laser calls if they have a question so they get stuck. Because a lot of times that what they're worried about is that they got money, they'll get stuck, and they won't be able to move forward. And then I always tell them, and if you don't use them, you know, you can add them all together at the end we can do a strategy call for the whole 45 minutes. Um, They love that, right? You know, usually those things are super easy. So I find that some of the things that they ask for or that I could give them, that that, that's just what they want. Because it's really, if you didn't ask enough to find out what is the thing. And I think a lot of times, one of the things for people is that they're afraid that they're going to, again, because they've probably done it before, send money and they're afraid that they won't do it and they'll get stuck. So when you're asking the question, I want to go back to them, is one of the questions that you ask people when you're in the discovery part, and if you do, how do you position it, of the question is, what have you already invested? Because like I find for me in marketing, I find that knowing what they've already done and invested, it helps me a lot if I already know to listen to them. Oh, yeah, I paid blah, blah, blah to do this, and it did work out for me. 
I want to make sure I'm not going to add that into the thing that I'm going to say in my offer. So do you find that that is a question that is important to ask early on? I think it's it can be business dependent. Um, I like the question for a few reasons. What have you already tried? That's how I would probably frame it. What have you already tried? Because if they had done something in the past and it was working, they'd probably still be doing it. Why would they be talking to me? So for me, I might say, what have you already tried in relation to sales? So this might give me an indication of like, I read a book or I worked with a sales coach or they had a different style than me, or, you know, I went through a course and didn't actually complete it. Okay. So that's all great information for me that one, they know what it's like to coach with somebody. And so I might explore a little bit around that if that was their answer. Like, what what did like what did you get out of working with a coach and what was it that didn't quite resonate with you? Like I would maybe want to know like, what worked and what yeah, would they like to see different? Makes a lot of sense. God just told me, Nikki, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for being so generous. And you actually have a gift for them as well. So tell them a little bit about the gift. The button will be below. So whether you're watching it on my YouTube channel or whether you are listening to it, the button is right there. I tell them about the gift. So the gift is, uh, it's an ebook. It's called Closing the Sale. And it kind of talks through those last three steps of the closing process. And it will give your audience the opportunity to get some language suggestions, kind of reinforce the things that are working for them and make sure that like, oh, here's something I can try to do different. So I would love to gift that. And it's, uh, if you go to yoursalesmaven.com forward slash patty, you can go and grab that ebook. It, it's my gift to you. And then we'll be connected. And and uh, there's lots of other, a lot of it that comes after. So Nikki, what's the best way for people to connect with you? The best way is to check out my podcast, which is Sales Maven, easy to find, uh, to get that ebook and then we'll be connected. And then I tend to hang out on LinkedIn and Instagram. So if you're a social media person and you like either of those platforms, that's fabulous because we also have the button below for those as well, as well as her podcast and her book, The Selling Staircase. So for all of those, the buttons are just below. So Nikki, thank you so much for being here with me. This has been a fabulous uh, conversation and I appreciate you so much. And to my audience, thank you so much for being here with us today and every single week. And if you like this episode, and I am sure you did, please like and review it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you haven't checked out our marketing media and magazine, make sure you grab your free copy at www.m3digitalmatter.com. Until next week, have a phenomenal week. Thank you for joining us today on the Marketing Media and Money Podcast. To shorten your learning curve even more, make sure to grab your free copy of the Marketing Media and Money Magazine at m3magazine.com. That's M, the number three, magazine.com. I promise your business will thank you.